Free, and it is about the autonomous movement of Freifunkerei. I have learned there is no English word for that, and the speaker is Gregor Peterson. Please give him a warm welcome. Am I turned on? Yes, I am turned on. Little reverb, little echo. Can you turn the echo down? Is this better? Uh, no, I, I've tried to keep my voice down, to try to keep the noise down. Um, better? Ooh, <laughs> it's called magic. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Gregors Peterson. I will do a lot of old school style stuff today. I will just talk, no slides, nothing, no entertainment, free to fall asleep. Uh, but um, as I said, my name is Gregors Peterson. I'm an anthropologist by trade. I live in Copenhagen. Um, presently, I'm uh, engaged in a research project on free software and ownership relations, uh, which is somewhat different from what I'm going to speak on, on and about today. Um, I chose to use the title Freifunkerei, uh, Do It Yourself Society Against the State, for my talk today. Um, I have for a number of years been involved or participating or um, experiencing the Freifunk movement in, uh, here in Germany and in ways how it has been spreading based on their approach with uh, the practical use of mesh networking as a way of establishing parallel infrastructure in urban areas but also in landscape, large landscape areas. Um, and it, it is my aim with this talk to, to try to take a look at the Freifunk movement as an example of a, of a do-it-yourself society against the state. Uh, and uh, this will, of course, lead to me talking at least somewhat about what the state is. And uh, this happens in, in, a, in a number of reflections on a, a book written by a French anthropologist called Pierre Clastre uh, more than 30 years ago. Um, and that book had or, and has the title Society Against the State. And um, he simply asked, or Pierre Clastre asked himself the question, is it possible to imagine a society without a state? Is it, is it possible to imagine a society without a state structure as we know it? And as what we've been knowing for centuries and millenniums. Um, and I will also have to specify that I'm in no way speaking as a representative of Freifunk. Uh, and I'm not speaking on behalf of Freifunk. I'm simply speaking about um, Freifunk as an example for this talk and uh, as a way to put my own experiences and reflections into a structure which makes sense to me. And it's a result of, of I've had a number of things which kept bugging me, kept uh, kind of irritating me. They've been sitting there and I wanted to kind of take care, grasp them. And uh, so a little bit about the structure. I'll um, first try to take a, a closer look at what Pierre Cluster was actually talking about when he started or wrote this book, Society Against the State. Then I'll look a little bit about at, directly at the Freifunk movement and what that movement is or and has evolved into. And then I'll try to bring these two subjects or issues or, or structures or entities together uh, under a common term called horizontalism. Um, and I have to say, there's a lot of um, things going on in respect to the state right now. But I, for me, this speak or this talk is very much in this positive sense. I, I look at what is taking place right now as, as a, a world filled with opportunities which are there to be grasped and to be done something with, and we have to do it ourselves. But it's, it's a 
from what, some point of view, it's, it's a very, very positive situation we're in. Um, and that's also why I used the title Frei von Karai. Then in Germany, or in German, there is this, if you add Rai to something, it suddenly becomes very, very nice. Kind of happy, fun, um, something which is dynamic. And uh, I'm trying to grasp my own positive sense with that. Um, and further, it seems that this year the society track here at the conference has kind of um, gone into a situation where it displays a strong interest in the state and also a lot of actions against acts done by the state. And uh, this takes place on a background of uh, increased control and increased uh, actions by the state which seem to be repressive and oppressive and uh, it is all done in the name of uh, fight against terror and terrorism, the protection of the state itself. And I think it's very, very important here to remind everyone that there is a distinct difference, a distinction between the state and the society. Um, and this is, I think this is unfortunately quite often forgotten or ignored, that the state is not the same as the society. Um, and it's, it's very, very important to remember that there is something called the civil society, which is not necessarily dependent on the state as powerful structure. Um, and it is very strange and odd things are happening with this state structure that we are all experiencing. It's like it's getting rid of itself. <laughs> I don't, I think it's really, really confusing and it's odd and it's strange. Uh, it's like the state leaves its citizens behind. It's, um, privatizes all the institutions which are representing it. Um, and the whole relationship between the, the citizen and the state are kind of completely broken. Um, but, and what is put instead? The market. Everything has to be marketized. Um, and it's, it's really odd because the state has since, like the initial Greek idea, been, been focused on kind of fulfilling basic aspects or taking care of basic aspects of the life of society. Um, the, li the state has guaranteed certain rights uh, to the individual and the group, and uh, mo in, in, in the way to, do, to guarantee these rights, it has monopolized the political power to ensure uh, the needed force power to enforce this monopoly, um, which is kind of fun. Um, and it's been involving and, and uh, developing a long list of institutions which are guiding and controlling the acts of the society. Like it's, there's been like all these public services, education, transportation, communication infrastructure, armies to protect the borders of the state. Um, but all these symbols, if you look at them as symbols and institutions are being kind of broken and thrown away by the state presently. They're being privatized. So what is actually left of the state? It's like all these institutions which have kind of made the life of its citizens of society working, been kind of created the foundation for the daily life of everybody. They've been privatized and now the state doesn't really, it's like, it's not really there anymore. And instead you have this market structure which runs on a principle of individual ownership and monetary transactions. And um, it is the state is doing away with itself, or at least with the symbols, the institutions, which it used to have as representations. And what is left? There is this monopoly of power. It still clings to this monopoly power. It's, it's, in some ways, it's, it's what is there. It can only enforce its existence through enforcing its monopoly on the use of power. Um, and in what direction can the, power, can the state wield this power? It's very simple. Either it could go at war. <laughs> 
the outside enemy, or it can wield the power against its own citizens, the members of the society. And right now we are in this really, really interesting situation that it can actually do twice at the same time. It can both be at war with the outside enemy and be at war with its own citizens. It's a very interesting situation, and it's just because of what? Because there's this whole thing about terrorism, and the big question, who are the terrorists in a global world? <laughs> it's very fun. Um, oops. And as I said, this talk is very much based on this book by Pierre Clastre called Society Against the State. And there's, of course, a reason for why I've chosen this book. I have to admit I read it. Uh, but apart from that, it's, it's uh, one of the very, very few classics within something which is emerging right now as anarchist anthropology. Uh, so it's, it's kind of also becoming an academic classic. Um, and what Pierre Claster did was that he asked uh, himself the question, what is the state thing? Uh, Max Weber, the, the German sociologist, has uh, stated that the state uh, is based on the assumption that it has the monopoly over the leg legitimate use of force in a given territory. The state is constituted through the monopolization of political power and the means to wield it. That was kind of what Max Weber said. What say? It's probably he's probably not wrong there, but. Pierre Clastre simply opposed this view and, and stated, in some societies, political power does not exist. So he simply says, Max Weber says political power exists, and there is a very specific structure which handles it. And Clastre, no, it doesn't exist. And what he said was that, as an anthropologist, he had a, a, a firm can basis for stating this, and he said, there are numerous societies which do not have a state. And they are not small scale. They are also large scale societies with millions of individuals. Uh, and he based this on uh, his ethnographic work in uh, South America during the 60s and early 70s. He, uh, he was so unfortunate to, to die in 74, so he could not, due to that, continue his work. But um, um, so his ethnographic work is more than 40 years old. And what he experienced in South America was that you had tribal structures with a chief, or what was named as a chief. Uh, but this chief or leader of the tribe uh, only had representational power or a representational role. It was like, this person didn't really have any power. He could just represent. He, could, he was very often some sort of international liaison officer. <laughs> he took care of talking to the neighbors. <laughs> and um, in that sense, he, got, he was given authority by the tribe. But uh, he was not, the authority was not his. <laughs> he was giving it. Given, he was being given it by, or she was being given it by, the members of the tribe, and if he behaved wrongly, if he, did, if he misrepresented them, he would be kicked off, even with violence, or she would be kicked off. So it was like actually a pretty bad position to be in. You had to do all the work, but everybody blamed you anyway. <laughs> and it always ended up with, it wasn't very, very popular to be the chief or the leader, but somebody had to do it, and somebody was eventually elected or chosen to do it. <laughs> Um, and uh, Cluster continued it because a lot of his work was done with typically small tribal groups. But he said, um, how many people did actually live in South America before, before these Spanish conquistadors came along? And how many people lived in South America during the early parts of the conquest? Um, if you look at official numbers, say, or uh, official Spanish conquistador numbers, or official historical numbers, you'll say very few people. South America was mainly empty, ready to be conquered, taken, 
Nobody was there. Nobody was owning it. Gosh, us conquistadors are now owning it, <laughs> which was very fun. Um, but in reality, a lot of information was is hidden or ignored. Um, and then it seems that South, Af South America was actually quite densely populated. Uh, Pierre Claster did his main work along the Brazilian coast, and uh, his estimate was that uh, in, um, in contrast to the official numbers stating that there might be a, maybe one or two million people living in the country the size of Brazil today, he was more close to, say, somewhere between 50 and 100 million. And a lot of these people were actually living in, uh, in uh, cities or city-like structures with up to 20,000 inhabitants. And there were extensive trade networks, and uh, they were definitely not small and isolated, and they were went either or neither very primitive. Um, these trade networks were very extensive, going all the way up along the coast, across the Andes. Uh, people traveled all over the place. But there was one very, very interesting st thing about this whole... You had lots of people living there, and you had no state structure in sight. You had no, like, king. You had no, like, ruling class. Uh, you had nobody uh, stating, we are in charge, we have the power to wield the power. Uh, nothing. And often it's said that, oh, they were just too primitive to actually have developed a state. No. They rejected it. They said, or they actually practiced that this taking for granted dichotomy between oppressed and oppressor, as, as well as the centralized uh, political power structure, they were acting against it. They were saying, no, the whole structure of society was built on taking action against the building or the developing of a state structure. And, uh, and this primitive society, as it's, it's normally noted or identified, uh, is from the point of view of Cluster one, of, one that relax, rejects the alienating political forms which we know so well today. Um, and it's, 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 it's a pure reality that uh, other forms of, of societies exist and uh, they can also uh, be very large scale and they don't have to be submissive to a state model. Um, and what this does is that it, it uh, opposes the present dogma that uh, society is unimaginable without a central power. Um, that the end point of society requires a class of powerful leaders. It's just something we assume that we, we're living in a world where there's, there's always somebody, like a small class group of people, it might be a parliament, it might be aristocracy, it might be whatever, that they're actually in, in charge. But it doesn't have to be like that. It's just one, in, it's just one point in an endless development. Um, and uh, Cluster is criticizing specifically the, this evolutionist notion that things can only develop in one direction and the end point is the state structure. But he's also uh, criticizing uh, Rousseau's notion of the noble savage. Because in that notion, you have this sense that savages or the primitives know nothing about power. But he says, no, they definitely know not something about power because they're rejecting it. They're rejecting the centralized structure of power use. Um, and um, he further states that the natural state for humans wanting to preserve autonomy the ability to act on their own behalf and act at their own will is, uh, can be a society structured to actively avert the rise of, of this despotic power. And this is, in very clear terms, a society against the state. Um, and I think, for me, 
Um, I read, the first time I read this uh, book by Cluster was uh, something like 15 years ago. But I think um, it still resonates, and it resonates even stronger today in, in response to what takes place on as state actions and uh, state representations. Um, and this enforced dominant model of the market economy. And what happens is that I have this experience, or it, it's my reflection that the state in its present form are abandoning the former social contract. Now I'm very much talking about a, a Northern European context where you have this social state notion we had some sort of a, a social contract between citizens and a state structure, which guarantees rights and services and obligations. Uh, and, but this is being abandoned by this present state structure, and it somehow leaves this odd but very, very interesting wasteland um, in the wake of this abandonment. And um, this also makes me wonder, because it, it, it actually as a reflection asks this very, very interesting question, do I actually need the state at the present moment? It doesn't really seem to care about me. It takes away all the institutions I've been used to. It privatizes uh, my employer. I'm working at a university right now, being privatized. Uh, it takes away my infrastructure, being tri privatized. Do I actually need it? Good question. And I think... Um, that, in that sense, Freifunk is for me an, a really, really interesting example because uh, it kind of merges Pierre, Pierre Clastres' notions of this society against the state, the stateless society, with uh, present-day do-it-yourself movements or societies. And um, it's very interesting because what you see around the world is that you have these large-scale structures, social entities or groups, they can be small, they can be very, very large, who are kind of infecting all these niches and, and wasteland areas which are being left by the state or abandoned or which they are fighting to conquer. <laughs> and uh, in that sense, I think it's, it, Freifunk is a very, very interesting example. In as much as you can say that it came out of a history or a setting which took its beginning in, initially it probably took its beginning in 89 with, with the reunification of the German state. Uh, but it took its uh, way in the 90s uh, and uh, it took place mainly in the beginning here in Berlin. Um, there was immense interest in this no whole new country to ex be explored and developed in the East. And um, it was a, a, a quite, in the 90s, it was a quite hectic process where you had all these new space and people grabbed it and they squatted buildings and created new art places and, and definitely just grabbed this new open land and, and became self-organizing. And of course, this was also a commercial interesting setting then uh, you had to invest, you have to build, you had to make money somehow. And uh, one of the things which happened was that uh, the state and uh, the people in power looked ahead and said, we need optical fiber for our coming information infrastructure. So they, everybody was lying, laying down optical fiber. And uh, then the bubble blew around the year 2000. Oops. The big dreams and all the investments went kaboom and gone. And uh, what happened was that uh, a new term was born, opal areas. And uh, this min means or meant that large part of uh, Berlin was actually abandoned and left without any feasible way of getting a broadband access, despite the fact that you had kilometers and kilometers and thousands of kilometers of fiber optical fiber in the ground, but nobody was really willing to use it or invest the money or giving anybody access to using it. Um, and response came by itself. Um, somebody thought, okay, let's do it ourselves. Um, 
There were several influences. Uh, there was a big meeting with, with uh, a number of people from Consume in London. And um, there was this new technology, cheap wireless uh, network technology. Uh, and, and just a lot of people who had a, their day-to-day -day activity, they, they liked uh, to fumble around with technical stuff uh, that political interests. It was a very, very interesting setting there in, in 2002, 2003. And what was even more interesting was that the state was completely passive. Like everybody was saying, we need, we want to develop our economy, to build businesses, to build civil society. We need broadband internet access in Eastern Berlin. But the state says, not our problem. Um, and what happened was that uh, simply a new way of growing infrastructure emerged. First, the initial idea was to build a Berlin backbone, going across Berlin Mitte, the central parts of Berlin. Uh, but uh, to be honest, this actually never really worked out. And I think for me, this is my personal analysis, it didn't work out because it was a reproduction of a classical managed horse, a vertical power structure. Because if you build a managed backbone, you need somebody to manage it. And somebody will manage it, and they will be in power and control. And that actually ended being a very big issue. And what then manifested was somebody got the idea, OK, we have this OLSR daemon. Mesh networking is possible. It hasn't really been done that much in large scale, but let's do it. Let's simply make a, a system which is based on ad hoc mode and uh, that the thing, the network, kind of organizes itself. Um, and uh, this mix of traditions, if you can call it that, or people uh, in Berlin with the technology and, and ideas coming from wherever they were coming from, became this mashup which actually created or resulted in a cutting edge technology. It was like, we still, I, I pretty much still believe that the, the mesh networks in, in Germany and Europe are the biggest in the world. And uh, that's very, very cutting edge. You don't see that anywhere else. And uh, a lot of the technical work which has gone on and gone on with mesh technology in general is actually a product of these autonomous structures. I think that's pretty, pretty powerful. Um, and what has grown since these first acts and actions and the first initial building in Berlin is that it has, has spread. It spread across Germany, it spread across Europe, it spread across, across the globe. And uh, what is really, really, really interesting about it is that it spreads and it spreads in a very, very diverse mode. It's full of diversity. The mesh structure in itself is uh, turn off the phone, whoever has it. Um, the very interesting thing is that you have the mesh networking basis as a common platform, but there you can do whatever local implementation you want. It's not like there's like the implementation here in Berlin, but it's different from the one in Dresden or the one in Leipzig or the one in Rostock or the one you have anywhere. Um, and I think this is actually a very, very, very interesting thing because there isn't anybody who is saying it has to be in this way, it has to be in that way. You don't have anybody who is in, in a position that they have the power to, to do that. Uh, they, it's simply a question about keeping it in such a way that the, fundamental, the, the fundamental structure can talk together. And uh, right now, what is happening is that you have all these mesh clouds all over the German areas, German-speaking areas across Europe. They're getting connect connected right now via OpenVPN and, and similar things. And in that way, they're keeping this diversity and their local autonomy, but they're still able to create a larger society, a larger structure. And... Uh, what is very, very significant here is that there is no central power. There is no central control. There is nobody who is actually managing this growing structure. And um, I think that's bringing us back to, to Pierre Klesser's 
notion of the society against the state because I think he experienced basically the same in South America. He looked at large-scale societies, large-scale groups of people who were able to make things work out without having somebody in charge of what direction they were going in. And um, I think the result is, or, or the, the point is that if we are, or if people are in a situation that they're able to control major decisions by themselves in, in an autonomous way, uh, and they're free to contribute in whatever way they can, and not being dictated by somebody how to do th stuff, uh, it's actually a way that creates social well-being. Um, and, uh, and I have to admit, where is all this pointing? If, if we look at this Pierre Cluster and we look at, at Freifunk, say, okay, it, it's, it's possible to create social structures which are independent of a notion of the state or independent of a centralized power structure. And uh, I seem to have... And what this points in direction of is, is a notion or a, a concept which has been keyed, horizontalism. And uh, it's based on, horizontal or horizontalism is based on um, basically free flow of information, uh, free access to, and uh, it's simply a, a way of, of uh, looking on, on this mashup or mix-up or getting together of, of people, technology and ideas, how they converge, and uh, how this results in, in a lot of just let's do it ourselves, just action. Uh, and in that way, finding solutions to problems or questions which hadn't been possible to answer before. And this very, very significantly opposes this well-known vertical power structure where you had somebody in the top saying has to be done this way we are implementing this structure but in a horizontal perspective it's like just happens people get together they kind of agree okay well and then they diversify themselves and then eventually for some reason magic or whatever it will work out um, and the characteristics of this new kind of horizontalism. It's uh, very much based on primary mutual aid. You're living with people, you're, you're having social um, contacts with other people, you're helping them. It's mutual. Um, and it, this mutual aid is, is in practical terms re-emerging as day-to-day -day praxis. Um, and it reaches across known boundaries. It reaches across, across this old state or, or national boundaries, across the globe, across social boundaries. Uh, and because more, it becomes about um, just basically acting, but of course acting in a lot of small steps, but uh, keeping this action and ac activity in constant move. And the actions taken and decisions made are highly based on self-organization and uh, direct involvement by people on an autonomous basis. So they're doing it out of their own will and they're doing it because it makes sense to them. Um, and there are, of course, a lot of people who have been discussing these things in other contexts. I think one, there, are, there are probably two individuals or two researchers, scientists or critical minds who have been uh, inspiring me in this sense. And one of them is uh, Colin Ward, uh, British, I think he's sociologist, maybe. But, but he's been uh, specifying this uh, notion of uh, strategy of the many small steps where he says, okay, let's all do small steps and eventually we'll get there. Uh, the other very important uh, thing he has admitted to is that uh, people make mistakes. 
But if they're their own mistakes, if it's a mistake I made, I'll know, okay, it was my mistake, I fucked it up, I'll have to find a new solution. <laughs> but it's my problem and I accept it. It's not somebody else who came along and said, okay, I made the, I, it was my mistake, I made a wrong decision, but you have to fix it, or it will never get fixed. It's just something, okay, I made it, it's my problem, I have to figure out. Or I'll have to ask somebody else about it. And maybe they can help me, maybe I can help them, it'll work out. Uh, another commentator is Hakim Bey, who's talking about these, uh, he's m probably most well known for uh, his notion of the temporary autonomous zone. But he also has uh, a further development of that, and that's permanent autonomous zones. And I think what we're seeing here with a structure like Fifunk is that it's actually creating a permanent autonomous zone. It creates something which is completely independent of the state, or in some degrees is quite independent of the state, and it runs by itself. And it creates opportunities for a lot of other people. Um, and I think Fifunk is a sense a very, very good example of, of these do-it-yourself societies, do-it-yourself do actions which takes place basically around the globe. And it happens as a reaction to this abandonment by the state. Um, and And in that way, as a reaction against the state trying to increase its control because basically there's nothing else for the state to do, or in very short time there will be nothing else for the state to do except increase the control. Everything else will be, will be privatized and will be dependent on do you have money to buy the service? Yes, you can get it. If you don't have money to buy the service, you will get nothing. Um, and I think what is needed to do is to look at the situation we're in, in a positive sense. And um, in that way, start doing stuff ourselves, and through that, increase our common acts of the resistance. Because as long as we act, as long as we do something, we'll resist that things are moving against our own interests. Um, and in that sense, to somehow get back to the theme or the sub-theme or the undercurrent of this whole uh, Congress this year is that uh, I think we have to declare for ourselves that we are all terrorists and uh, that we are still doing it ourselves. Um, and in some way or another, we all long for a, a society without a state. We all long for a society which doesn't dictate us what to do every day and every minute and every second of our life. We still have to maintain society. We still have to be social entities. It's not like ultra-liberalism or anything like that I'm, I'm, I'm talking for, but um, we just like to be able to make our own decisions. And uh, I think in that way, Freifunk is to me an inspiration because it's actually, it's, it's a manifestation that it can actually take place. It can happen. It's possible. It's just about doing it and, and looking at what crazy ideas can you get? And go ahead. And then suddenly you have something which has actually brought an in extreme sense of social well-being to a lot of people. And that sense, I, it's, it's very important for me to, to thank all these friends and, and inspirations I've gotten from Frankfurt, from Freifunk. And um, I hope in that sense that uh, Freifunk can be an inspiration to others in other contexts, in other settings, uh, because it's basically about, in the present situation, that we have to acknowledge that we have to do stuff ourselves. We have to act, we have to act directly, but it's also an opportunity to engage ourselves in, in uh, taking part in, in where the world is moving, and not just leaving it to somebody else, to these unknown structures who would like to be in power, who think they are in power right now, to make the decisions for us. And I think that was pretty much what I had.
Are there any questions? I can see a hand in the back. Uh, test. Uh, it's more a comment than a question. Um, I agree with you that Freifunk is an interesting structure that shows how to do something without the state, but the state can be a problem for it. Uh, we now have the data retention law. I don't know what the exact implication is for Freifunk, but um, we know that we had a lot of oppression against Freifunk structures for people saying you're now responsible for other people downloading music over your network. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that could be a big problem for such structures if the state doesn't let us do these structures. Um, for me, I'm, I'm fully aware of that. Um, it's, it's something which uh, takes place across all of Europe with these logging of data. Um, and I think uh, it's the state acting against uh, something which makes it scared, like the freedom of people. And I think it's something which is needed to be defended. And for me, it uh, entails uh, that people have to be creative again and find out how to fight against the state. Um, and definitely what is needed is to be aware that uh, you can play by the rules of the state or you can rewrite them. And it's needed to rewrite the, the rules. It's needed to do actions which are, are simply creating alternatives which are robust and which can withstand what the state does. And I think in many ways it, it's actually taking place with Freifunk because it's not possible to control something like Freifunk. Of course you could if you make the full crackdown, you went out and you simply confiscated every single router or node or network part which runs Fifung software or similars. But I think that's not possible. And the more people who are getting involved, the, the less likely it will be that the state will be able to act in that way. So it's simply a question of the more people who are taking part part in this doing, let's do it ourselves, the more resistance there is and the less can the state actually do. Do you think there are anything like design patterns or ways to, to, to improve this kind of, this kind of process uh, going on? The question was if there's uh, any design patterns or ways of, of supporting uh, these acts. Um, I think the best thing is just to spread the idea. Um, keep information flowing. As soon as information is stopped, the ideas are broken. Things have to be kept in flow. Uh, this can happen in many different ways. It can happen as we have the internet right now. It can happen by classical shortwave radio. It can happen by just people meeting, traveling. And as long as it's possible to keep the ideas in flow, it will more or less, from my point of view, happen by itself because people will pick up the ideas and become creative. Hi, um, I'm, I'm one of the founders of the Funkfeuer network in Vienna, which is very similar to Freifunk. And I just wanted to state, like, um, all the people in the German-speaking countries, Freifunk, Funkfeuer, and so on, should really know that, that they are not the center of the world in this technology. Um, there's a huge network in Athens, it's huge, it's covering the whole area around Athens, around 2,000 nodes. There's a huge network in Spain, GifiNet, uh, there is a network in the Czech Republic which covers almost the whole country. Um, so this is something that I, is, has been bothering me personally like for uh, almost a year now and I want really to s clearly state here to everybody in the German speaking countries Freifunk is not the center of the world, it's just one of those networks. And it's very important to know and it's very important to cross-connect to all of these other networks because they're also doing great, great research. That was my main point, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I've, I, know, I know about those other networks and I just used Freifunk as an example because I'm in Berlin and I would like to do 
some comments on that. But uh, I, th I think uh, if you look at Freifunk, it has been an, as a concept, as an idea, it has been an inspiration across the world. And, uh, but there are many inspirations. And um, I think that's important. I also know in Denmark we have a, a network with uh, about 15,000 users and in a rural area. So there are networks all over the place and they all have to be connected and the idea has to be spread. But again, they're all diverse. They're all different. They all have their own interpretations, their own ways of doing things. And they definitely all have their own languages <laughs> and um, their own traditions. So work has to, be, has to be done in that direction. But it takes time and it takes somebody who's willing to travel around and do it. Yes? Uh, yes, I have a question or more a comment. Um, and it's about the scalability. Because um, I think that um, if you just think about scaling the whole system of uh, Freifunk or mesh networking in general up, and uh, that you have autonomous systems in, uh, all over the, the, the place, so you have these uh, self-organizing autonomous systems which will interconnect with each other, mm. then um, there will be some kind of mechanism that these will connect to each other through uh, routing protocols or whatever. Um, this will work as far as you have this practical approach of a, or a techno technological approach. But I believe that this will not work um, if you have more like um, the um, ethical basis or some other problems that um, are not technical nature. Because as soon as you want to interconnect um, these thoughts or these, uh, these norms, Norman in, in German, um, then these autonomous systems must have some way to communicate in um, a matter that is efficient enough to still um, make decisions. And I think that this will only work if you, um, if these autonomous systems will just, well, take some kind of leader or some kind of representative. And as soon as you have um, this, this stream into that the, that the, that the mass of an autonomous system, the, the, the greater part, will um, have their opinion and will dictate that to their representative. And this representative will then, again, uh, perhaps aggregate these norms to another representative. Then you have a horizontal system. And um, I would like to ask if um, you think that this can be um, prohibited because at the end you still you have a state again with a horizontal structure. Vertical structure. Yeah, with a vertical structure, of course. Um, to me, this talking together is actually in some ways not really an issue because you have a common set of protocols. You have a common set of, of uh, package, packages which is being moved around. And in practice, what I see is that it's actually not really an issue because you have an interest in, in shoveling information from one point to another point. And somehow people will figure out how to do that without actually breaking their own system. And it's just an exchange. So I don't really see that the technical issues as being important. And the scalability is, you have, a common, you have enough common uh, ground that it'll work out. The question was more because, I mean, excuse me. Um, I'm sorry, perhaps I didn't make myself clear. Um, as I un under, un uh, understood you, you took um, the mesh networking as an example of how a stateless structure might work. But as far as I understood you, you also uh, want to make um, an analogism over to um, the other problems because of this, uh, the stateless structure. Mm. in general, that we don't need the state anymore. Mm. Did I take you wrong on that part? No. no. Okay, and my, my um, problem is that I don't think that this will work on norms. It will, it will work on technical stuff, like mesh networking, but I don't think that it will work on ethical. Like I think that's actually what uh, Pierre Cluster has proved, that it will work. It works, and it has worked, and it continues to work in a lot of different societies which are in the world today. Yes. Um, I wanted to still comment on the technical scalability. Uh, there is some, some very good news, like we, we improved all this R, the protocol, much more. And there's some very good news that I want to share briefly, like um, the newest version, which is not even yet in CVS, 
uses zero percent CPU load on a 400 node mesh network. Mm. So the CPU load was the main uh, stopper mm. for growth. So technically, these networks will continue to grow at least on the routing protocol level, very much so. Mm. Um, about social growth, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> but again, I think if you look at this issue with scalability, they all as our demon and scalability. It's simply that it was quite quickly it was found out there is a problem there. They were found different solutions. And I, for me, it, there keeps coming new solutions, new protocols, new ideas, and they're being built in. But they're being built in in such a way that it's possible to merge what you have together. So I think you have a constant creativity or creative force going, and new solutions are found to new problems. And as long as people are, it's, it's people's own solutions to their own problems, it'll work out. <laughs> I'm very positive about that. <laughs> Should we, last question? Thank you. Um, I can follow your ideas about having a society without state. And what you described is um, um, the situation having, uh, co having communication between each other. Mm -hmm. But um, living together is more than communication. Living together means also to have production and consumption. And my question is, uh, how can you include into this uh, Freifunk system a system which um, uh, makes a production and consumption prop, uh, possible to each person without having any concurrence or without any uh, profit. For you describe a system which is uh, locally based, and um, uh, I think it's very difficult to have uh, a locally based uh, system of production and, and consumption. That might be a problem um, to fulfill this society with, with, uh, with real life not only with communication. I think um, I didn't comment on, on, on neither production or consumption or profit. But, um, and of course, there are, that's economy, very much linked to economy. Um, but uh, I think, again, there are several, there is good solutions to it. Um, and uh, I think it's a reality that, of course, there will be profits for some. But um, again, it will be possible to find a different mo mode than what we have right now. But I think it's, it's, a, it's a much larger question you're asking. So it's, it's difficult for me to go into that right now. OK? Thank you very much for your time, patience. <laughs>